Oh. Hi, everybody. That's a, just a little something for a bit later. Um, I've always been here, Andy. <laughs> Hi, I was wondering if there was a recording for algebra over the weekend somewhere. I can only find the calculus recording. Oh, hang on. I need to turn off my... Um, I'm listening to myself on here. Okay, there we go. Um, yes, there is. Uh, let me just post it for you. So I uploaded the calculus, uh, sorry, the algebra lecture, but then YouTube died on me. And so I had to upload it again. And here it is. Da -da -da -da. Oh, it's already there. Yeah, okay. You beat me, you beat me to it, Andy. Um, yeah. Thanks, my man. Uh, so um, we've got some time to kill before the lecture starts. Oh. I did update the I did update the post on Moodle with the new link, but uh, I think I guess the one that went out to everybody through email is still the old link, which is frustrating um, for everybody. Looking fresh, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I try. I try. All right, um, what have we got today? So I was going to share with you a little bit of a little bit of something I've been working on just to just because just because maths is real tasty um, and you can do just about anything with it. So um, my particular specialty is doing maths and ancient history. Uh, and I want to share a little bit of this with you because you all got here a little bit early. So why not? Uh, why not just have a little chat together about something? Uh, does this work? If I, oh, I go here, yay, that works. Okay, so story time. You know it. Uh, this story is super fresh, though. Um, so I want to talk about measuring land. Now, when I uh, way, way, way back in time, uh, in the what's known as the Earth 3 period. So this is about uh, 2000 to 1900 uh, BCE. So about, let's, let's just say about 4,000 years ago. Um, about, uh, about this time, uh, about the Earth 3 time, all land was owned by the gods. Gods owned the land. You had the privilege of farming that land. Um, and then immediately afterwards, land began to shift from gods to private individuals. So land land ownership uh, became a thing. I'm not sure where this flat earth uh, thing came from. Uh, certainly these ancient people knew all about the world being spherical, or mostly spherical. Um, so when it's your land and my land, accurate boundaries start to become important to avoid neighbourly disputes. And the thing I love about this is that we actually have the wonderful thing about Babylon is that you have all this documentary evidence about what they're going on or what's going on, what they're thinking, what problems they have at the time. You look at e over in Egypt, all you've got is these huge pyramids. You have no idea what they were thinking and what they were really up to. And then over in Babylon, you've got just stories, commercials, accounts, prayers, recipes, poetry, mathematics. You've got everything there. So here is a little, a little bit of a poem from ancient Babylon. This one's about two scribes. The older scribe is all know, knowledgeable and wizened, and the younger scri scribe is all like, I'm the best scribe in town. And, um, and the older one puts him in his place. And he puts him in his place viciously as follows. Uh, you go to divide a plot, and you are not able to divide the plot. You go to a portion of field and you cannot even hold the tape and rod properly. The field pegs you are unable to place. You cannot figure out its shape. So that when wrong men have a quarrel, you are not able to bring peace. But you allow brother to attack brother. Among the scribes, you alone are unfit for the clay. Man, after a put down like that, I'd be totally destroyed. The younger one still thinks he's the best scribe in town and, uh, and fights back and says, when I apportion a field, I can apportion the pieces. So that when wrong men quarrel, I soothe their hearts and brother will be at peace with brother. Um, the important thing here is that land ownership is becoming the domain of mortal men, not the gods anymore. And when it's your land and my land, we care about where the boundaries are. <sighs> 
Righto. Uh, we'll, we'll continue this one a bit later. But that's, uh, that's, that's kind of, yeah, anyway. Um, that's Babylon for you. Scri scribes in math school uh, are talk, uh, talking smack to each other about who can survey land the best and why that's important. Leon says, does anyone know which tutorial we have to go to? You have a 4 p.m. tutorial, you have a workshop option and a tutor-led option. You can choose either. Um, the tutor-led ones are recorded, so yes, you can as uh, uh, as we yeah you can you can just watch them later if you want. Um, the interactive ones are, you know, as it says on the box, a bit more interactive. All right, so now I've now I feel like I've shared something with you, um, something cool. I, I particularly like this piece of uh, this piece of poetry because well, it's it's not poetry when written in English. But um, it, <laughs> I'm basically writing this article, and I took out, I took all these equations and just threw the equations away and replaced it with a piece of poetry. And people prefer reading things than uh, actually, actually. What's the name of this text? Is he speaking? Yes, I am speaking. Uh, with the name of this text. Oh, um, uh, let's see. What is the name of this text? It's got some freaky name because <laughs> it's just on a tablet. Uh, open. Da, 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 da. How do I go to like recent documents? Uh, yes, Isabella, if you are Babylonian, that will get you a HD. You have to convince me of your Babylonian heritage by performing uh, mathematics in a in Babylonian style. Uh, so if you submit to me your exam and it's written on clay in Akkadian, uh, HD, HD right there. You don't even have. <laughs> awesome. I look forward to I look forward to reading your exam. Uh, where am I? I was going to find out what that thing came, where that thing came from. So close that. Um, and okay, this uh, this that poem was called the dialogue between two scribes. Oh, it's, it's part of the dialogue between two scribes, basically two students talking smack to each other. <laughs> the exam will have to be delivered by a truck. <laughs> nice. Um, does that mean I get to write the exam on clay as well? Um, awesome. <laughs> and all your computations have to be done with an abacus. None of this. Uh, okay, I, I should probably actually get started with the thing, but let me let me write down what the poem is called from. Ah. And I can never spell this fan S T I P H O U T. There we go. So that should be enough for you to get your pause on uh, on what you need to know. This is the early time. This is this. It's um. It's basically a, an older scribe telling the younger scribe to uh, just pull his head in. He's not the greatest. He's not God's gift to scribes, um, and he's got lots to learn. Anyway, the younger scribe doesn't learn the lesson. He, he still thinks he's awesome. Um, let's begin the lecture uh, from here, systems of linear equations. So I will now press the recording button. Like so. Okay. Systems of linear equations. I might just remind you briefly. Um, 
uh, in the previous lecture, and there's a recording on YouTube. Some of you are having trouble finding the recording because I had to re-upload the video. So you can find the recording using the... Thank you, Andy. Andy's got my back right there. Uh, the recording is on YouTube following that link, or you can click on the Moodle post, but you have to go through Moodle, not the one that's in your email inboxes. <sighs> um, in that recording, and I'll just remind you now, we discussed the important notion of a linear combination, and I'll tell you what a linear combination is right now. V1, dot, dot, dot. A linear combination is any expression of this form. So you have typically have some handful of vectors, v1, v2, up to, all the way up to vn, and you can mush them together by taking a certain scalar, like one or two times v1, and then some amount of v2, and adding, adding to that some amount of v3, and so on. It, it, all the things you can cook up with your, with your handful of vectors is, a, is a called a linear combination of those vectors. And you also have the span, span of your set of vectors, V1, V2, oh, Vn, is the set possible. So you know what a linear combination is. You just take uh, linear amounts of all the vectors and add them together. And the set of all possible things you can create from those vectors, or the set of all possible linear combinations is called the span, like this. So that's pretty much what uh, what the previous lecture was about. And I appreciate that's new. So um, let's get going. Systems of linear equations. Um, a system of linear equations, you might remember from your math 1131 days, it can be written nicely in this form. To solve such a system, um, or show that there are no possible solutions, then you, what you do is you take the A and the B and you throw it in this augmented matrix, A with a little bar down the side here, like so, and you reduce it to what's known as rho echelon form. And now we're just going to do a little taxonomy of all the different rho echelon forms and, uh, and what they tell you about the original equation. If this column here, turn, if this y column is a leading column, that is to say it's got a leading term in it, um, then the system has no solutions. And this is the first thing you look for. You get it in rho echelon form, and then you, you see if there's a leading term in that on the, on the right-hand side of that bar. And if there is, no solutions. If y is not a leading column, then there are solutions. And it, it really depends on uh, where the other leading terms lie as to how many solutions you have. If every column is leading, so all these columns of you are leading, but the Y column is not, then the system has exactly one solution. And if there are non-leading columns, as that is otherwise, then the system has infinitely many solutions. That's what you learned. Uh, and we'll do a few examples. Uh, maybe I can just do a few, uh, I'll do a ex few examples below. Um, the number of non-leading columns tells us the numbers of parameters involved in the solution. So this, we're going to go a little bit deeper now, a little bit deeper. 
not only we want to know more about this thing. So let's let's do an example. This thing here. I will now enumerate for you the leading terms. If I the leading terms, I'll remind you are the first non-zero thing in each row. So here I just move along, I encircle the first non-zero thing I encounter, and this is a leading term. I do the same thing over here. I just move along the row and I circle the first non-zero thing I encounter. Start on the left and move along to the right till you see something that's not zero. That's another leading term. In this row down here, I move along and I see a zero, 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 zero. You know what? I never, I never found a zero here. So this is a non. This is a non-leading row. You don't care about non-leading rows. Non-leading rows are total. Just they, they tell you nothing. They absolutely nothing. You can cross them out and ignore them. That's totally fine. The uh, non-leading rows are, are meaningless. You have my permission to ignore non-leading rows. Um, it's considered polite to put them at the bottom of your row echelon form matrix. Um, but other than that, you can just pretend like they're not there. Uh, this one here, oh, let, let's let's do the taxonomy thing. This is the Y column. Notice that it's a non-leading column. So this is non. means that there are solutions as per our taxonomy up here. Um, now this one here, this one here is, uh, so we're, we're, we know we, we have Y as a non-leading column, then we know that this com column here is a non-leading column. And so we're, we're in this situation, we're in this scenario. So this is a non-leading column corresponding to X2. Uh, yes, leading uh, yes, leading column and pivot col column are the same thing. Non-leading column for X2, but this but this means more importantly, X2 can be any value. This the fact that the X2 column is a non-leading column means that. How can you tell which row is a leading row or not? Leading rows have uh, leading rows have leading terms in them. So this this first row is a leading row because it has a leading term. Non-leading rows are all zero. They're they're always all rows of zeros. So they're really easy to spot when you have a non-leading row. You get it into row echelon form, and if it turns out to if the row contains all zeros, it will never be a leading row. Um. But it's really the non-leading columns you care about. This column I've encircled in blue is a non-leading column. It's a column which has no leading term in it corresponding to the variable x2. This would be the column for x1. This would be the column for x2. This would be the column for x3. This would be the constant. The constants over here. And what's the difference between matrices with one parameter or two parameters? Oh, sorry, I just, just drew all over my thing. I was reading. Um, that's the shape of the matrix, Jeremiah. The shape of the matrix will tell you how many parameters there are. So these columns over here correspond to parameters, x1, x2, x3, uh, from our original equation. So here, uh, where x is x1, x2, x3. So for example, these are, remember, we're trying to find the x's by solving something. And these columns correspond to the x values or the, co the coefficients of the x values. The fact that, it, that and when you get a non-leading column, that means your variable is free. 
can be anything it wants. Uh, usually we name them Lambda 1, Lambda 2, stuff like that when they're free. Um, but for now, we just apply the taxonomy. This is an infinitely many solutions matrix. Let's do the same thing over here. Here's a matrix. It's in row echelon form. There's a leading term. There's a leading term. There's a leading term. How many solutions does this matrix have? Exactly one. Thank you, everybody. Exactly one solution. Note, uh, cool, one solution. It has, a, or sometimes people say unique solution. Uh, exactly one solution. <sighs> Note that it's in row echelon form, a nice way. Of, I mean, there's a technical definition of row echelon form, but uh, I think it's easier just to think about this as being a descending staircase. Your leading, your leading terms make this nice kind of staircase like that. Even this one over here is considered row echelon form because the staircase goes down like that only ever down one step. They can be long steps, but they can't be steep steps. You can only ever go down one step at a time. That's uh, that's row echelon form. This one over here, this is row echelon form. There's a leading term, there's a leading term, and all the way over here is a leading term. Is it row echelon form? Well, let's check it out. Goes down one step, another step, all the way along here, then down again. That's legit row echelon form. How many solutions? No solutions. Yeah, you apply that criteria. Zero solutions, no solutions. There's no such thing. Exactly. Max, uh, that's how you that's how you interpret the um that's how you would interpret the equation. Uh but you can just say no no solutions. And as soon as you see this, as soon as you see see that, that non-leading column over there, no solution. Okay. So that's just a brief revision of um of the kind of taxonomy of the different row echelon forms you're going to see. Sometimes you'll see ones with one solution, no solutions, or infinitely many solutions like this. Obviously, oh, <laughs> uh, thank you, Sha Shannon. That uh, made me laugh. Okay. Sha Sharon, uh, all right, let's go. Applications to spans. How does this relate to spans? So suppose you have some vector, some vector u, like this, and you have some set like that. How can you tell if the vector you have belongs to the span? Now, geometrically, what's going on here? Oh, Miguel says, but if we were in a world where zero didn't exist, could we say that how profound I'll, uh, I'll leave you to ponder that um have i got space here okay so how could we tell if u belongs to the span just geometrically uh span of the vectors one two zero three minus two minus one And what does that look like? Well, you've got some plane. Here's your one vector. Here's the other vector. So this is the one, one, two, zero. This can be the three. This can be the three minus two minus one. So these two vectors, this, oh, the span of these two vectors forms a, a kind of two dimensional plane if you like a grid, imagine a grid created by all the different uh, parallelograms made by the blue vector and the red vector. Now, then that, that two dimensional grid goes in a plane. It might be kind of wonky on the horizontal axis. Uh, and we're trying to figure out is you, is you in here? Does you, 
is you in the plane like that or and that would be you in span let's call this one x oh, i'll do it in blue let's call this one x and this one y this would this blue one would be you in the span of you and uh, x and y it's supposed to be an x uh alternatively it could stick out of the plane so here's here it is in black it could just be sticking out like that that could be you and that would be you not in the span x y Geometrically, that's what we're trying to figure out. You've got uh, you've got this span, spans are subspaces, things like planes and that kind of stuff. Uh, does span mean is parallel to both? Yeah. Yeah, it does. So it has, yes, you can think of it that way, Jonathan. Yes, you can. And that's perhaps even a nice way of thinking about it. Um, so that's a geometrically or that's the geometric meaning it's in the span when it's in the kind of this space generated by the uh, it, it's literally in the space li literally in that subspace or equivalently can you be uh maybe i'll say does you have three minus two minus one. That is to say, it does, is you a linear combination of those two vectors? Is it possible to express it in this way? Um, can a solution involve comparing and calculating the cross product vector with a set S? Uh, that's a very three-dimensional specific uh, uh, view on the world. And I'm, a, I'm not an R3 supremacist. I want to teach you methods that work in any, uh, any scenario. Um, so that, that, that trick, Yes, that trick would work in R three, but let's uh, let's not let's not concentrate on just that one. Um, Jonathan, we'll we'll get there. We'll get there. Let's do two vectors first. Okay, so the following are equivalent. U is an element of the span. Okay, so we have some kind of geometric meaning of what that is. You've got the span of vectors. That's a subspace, and U is in that space. Um, U is a linear, so let's draw a little picture just to kind of go with that. There's the vector, there's the space, span, S, and here's U. U is in that space. Um, what about this one? U is a linear combination of the elements of S. That is, that is to say, uh, S equals, say, some V1, uh, dot 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 vn and u can be expressed as a linear combination of those things so there's a little bit of the first vector plus so a little bit of the second vector plus dot 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 plus v lambda n vn um we can find scalars alpha one alpha two such that well okay so this is um Coming back to the previous question, just literally, that's, that's the same as that. The last, now it's the last one. Um, the last one is the most useful one to us. This is, I mean, this one's kind of conceptual and geometric. This one's using some crazy definition about linear combinations that we've not really used before, but this one this one is a system of linear equations. And now you're in uh, the kind of uh, computational, you've got a computational framework you can work with. This, 
system, uh, this system of equations can be, with a bit of row reduction, reduced to this leading term, leading term, leading term. Here's my stairs. This is row echelon form, which means I can break out my taxonomy of uh, all different matrices and just look at this thing and say how many solutions it's got. And how many solutions does it got? In chat, please. <laughs> One. <laughs> no solutions. No solutions. Exactly. Thank you. Very yeah, ob obviously zero. Nice. Nice empty set of solutions. There are no solutions to this thing. Geometrically, what does this thing look like? Well, here's your plane. This is the span of the two vectors. Two, uh, one, one, two, zero, three minus two minus one. And says that there's the origin. This is a nice subspace of uh, R3. And here's your vector U sticking out like that. U sticks out like that. It's not in the place. It's not possible to uh, geometrically, it looks like that. Algebraically, it's not possible. Possible. That's what we just discovered. So ge geometric, ge this is the same thing. This is the geometric perspective. And this is the algebraic perspective. How do you know it sticks like it sticks out like that? Uh, maybe not exactly like that, but it's not in the plane. It's, it's not it's not within this kind of two dimensional sheet. That's what I've that's what I've discovered. So maybe it's maybe it's slightly kind of just next to it, or maybe it's out there perpendicular to it. I I, I don't know exactly how it stick, it uh, sticks out of the plane, but it's not in the plane because it doesn't have a solution exactly exactly. Things in here would have a solution. Things in here would be expressible in that way. Cool. All right. All right. Uh, let's ask a slightly different question. Is the vector uh, 0, 8, 1 in the span of S? Again, we're trying to do the same thing here. We're trying to say, we're trying to say, can uh, can we write? Uh, Zero eight one in uh, lambda one one two zero plus lambda two three minus two one. This is this is spoken as this is spoken as I e when you when you speak something like this, it's called a linear combination. of three minus two minus one. It's a minus one. Yep. Huh. The plane is the span of two vectors. So if it's not on the plane, then it's not in the span. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Kai. Um, one of the variables will be a parameter. So the other variable can be expressed in infinitely many ways as the parameter. Yes, that's also true. Uh, cool. All right, let's let's uh, let's just do this thing. Here's the leading term. Here's the leading term, and you can discover from this our taxonomy of uh, row echelon four matrices that this thing has a unique solution. In fact, you could even go further and discover by unpacking this matrix that alpha two or lambda two. Lambda two, or maybe I'll change those to alphas. Alpha. Alpha two. Um, you can discover that what the actual values of alpha one and alpha two are. It turns out that alpha alpha one is three and alpha two is minus one. So to come back uh, to a more kind of literal interpretation of what we're doing here, we've got the two vectors. Uh, maybe I'll do it down here. Here's our two vectors. Here's uh, one, two, zero. And I'll go one, two, three. Copies of it like that. And I've got this kind of plane 
I like to imagine the plane as being kind of given by this kind of grid. And you've got the red vector, which is, um, I might do it, uh, I might, I might do it this way. Here's the red vector. That's three minus two minus one. And again, it gives us some kind of grid. La -di -da. And the plane spanned by these things is the kind of checkerboard that I've drawn here living inside a three-dimensional space. And we've just discovered that the, the vector 0, 8, 1 is three times this thing. So that goes, let's go say three times up there and then minus one up there. So this vector here, this vector, this is 0, 8, 1, which is on the plane. In fact, more precisely, it's three times, you go three iterations of the blue vector, one, two, zero, and then negative one iteration of the red vector, three minus two minus one. Can they swap around? Absolutely. You could choose to go the red vector first, go that way. It's a parallelogram. So you can go, you can go either way around. It was supposed to be a parallelogram like that. If you Babylonians would have thought about this as a rectangle or parallelogram, they didn't have our very right triangle centric view of the world. To them, it's all rectangles, um, and this just happens to be the diagonal of uh, of that object. And there's no preference about which way around you go. Anyway, um, this is, so we saw an example of what happens geometrically when you're not in the span and also algebraically what happens when you're not in the span. You end up with a matrix like that. Uh, when you end up with a matrix like this, you are in the span and geometrically, so that's the algebraic side of things and geometrically, it looks like that. You've got this, uh, that's what it looks like for the vector to be in the span. Uh, and it is a plane through the origin. There's the origin right there. Huh. All right. Um, you know everything there is to know about determining whether or not vectors are in spans. This process of row reduction is uh, is pretty much all you need. If you swap alpha 1 and alpha 2, you'll get a different vector. Uh, no, you'll just discover that, I mean, it doesn't, alpha 1 and alpha, these values here, don't. they don't really care what label you choose to give them. Um, you'll end up discovering that there are solutions and you'll end up discovering that this the thing you multiply this vector by has to be three and the thing you multiply this vector by has to be minus one. What if there's infinite solutions? Damien, what if indeed? What if indeed? Um, we'll get there. I can see a few people, a few people are ready to know and, and, uh, and I promise you we'll get there, but we're going to go nice and slow. I want I want everyone to be just just like demanding. What if there are infinite solutions? I I must know now, and then I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> um, no, we're not. <laughs> um, for those of you who are just dying with suspense, I'll mention I'll mention just briefly. There's only one way to get to. 0, 8, 1, essentially one way. You have to take minus 3 of that vector and you have to, or 3 of that vector and you have to take minus 1 of that vector. Only one way. That's special. If there's infinitely many solutions, then there are lots of ways. I guess you leave. No, there's, there's a little, there's, it goes deeper, but that's just a little taste. Um, the question, uh, okay, so the question as to whether or not the given vector u was in the span uh, was the same as to whether or not asking the vector u, uh, okay, so yeah, we was in the plane. So geometric, again, this is called geometric and algebraic perspective on things. Okay. Given a set of vectors and a vector u, all in some m-dimensional space, m is not necessarily three for those of you equals three or not could be it could be some other number 
um, then u is in the span of s if and only if this system of equations ax equals u has a solution. So there's a, uh, that's a strange way of saying it. What was A? Oh my goodness, what was A? A is the matrix whose columns are the vectors of S. So there's a, I mean, this is just a compact way of saying all the stuff that we, uh, we've we um, done already. So let's take a little bit of a director's cut on, uh, on this question. Um, after you've done this a few times, you'll probably want to go straight to the matrix solution. But let's just see where this all comes from. I don't expect you to do this kind of solution every time, but let's uh, let's see what, uh, let's just use the definitions, see where this matrix comes from. And uh, and then and then once you've seen it a few times, then you, you'll probably just wanna go straight to the matrix. Okay. Okay. Huh. So there has to exist solutions. I'll just say suppose suppose B is in the span. say so then Okay, so where's the vector B belongs to the span when there exists that thing. That's just a state, that's just a collection of definitions. Now we'll make an assumption. We'll assume that B is in the span. And according to our definition, that means that there does actually exist a lambda one and lambda two. And equivalently, that means that there are solutions to the augmented matrix A bar B. So we're looking it's it's kind of a, a weird way of doing it because normally when you argument it, when you solve an augmented matrix you don't know if there's going to be solutions or, or not in this case we're doing it in reverse we know there's going to be solutions and we're going to row reduce anyway so it's a little bit strange a little bit strange Uh, one, two, zero, three, minus two, minus one, B one, B two, B three. So I'm just, it's only two operations I need to do here really. Row two is row two minus two, row one. That gets me one, three, B one, zero, minus two, minus six is minus eight. B two minus two B one, and that one stays the same. Uh, I might swap those around. So uh, row three, row two, zero minus one, 
B2 minus 2. Oh, that's B3. Uh, 0 minus 8, B2 minus 2, B1. And then finally, row 3 is row 3 minus 8, row 2, which gets me to row echelon 4. 1, 3, B1, 0, minus 1, B3, 0, 0, B2, Two minus two B one minus eight B three. Okay, how many solutions does my matrix have? At least one zero zero or one zero or one unique. There's a few. <laughs> Hang on a second. Hang on a second. I can do something techie here. Uh, polling. Okay. Hold on to your choices. Uh, here we go. Can you use two? Uh, let me um, let me remind you about something. We supposed B was in the span. We supposed B was in the span. Hmm. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Now we get yes. Now now I see it creeping right up. Thank you. We have, we've got it. Okay. I think, I think we're there now. Um, nice. So if B is in the span, this can't be a leading term. I move, I remember I move along, I move along this row. I see a zero. That's not a leading term. I see another zero. That's not a leading term. And then I see this, this thing, and this thing has to be zero. It has to be zero. Maybe I'll, uh, sorry, I'll just control set that. This thing has to be zero because I assumed it has solutions. Remember, remember this was, remember this was um, a kind of weird row reduction because we already knew how many solutions there were. We already knew that this thing had a solution. Since B in the span, then the must have and B2 minus 2, B1 minus 8, B, sorry, 8B3 has to equal 0, has to equal 0. Cool. Why only zero and why can we only have zero and one? Um, that's an interesting question. Can I not can I not answer that right now? Um, because I want to come back here for a moment. We just discovered something. Spans. I'll remind you the span of the spans look like vector spaces. So here we have the span span of S. And, uh, and we just got told conditions for B to be in the span of S. We just discovered, uh, we just discovered uh, B in span of S. Maybe I'll, you know what, I'm going to write it as X. No. I'll, yeah, I will write it as X. Just, no, I'll keep it as B. I'll keep it as B. B is in the span of X when... Uh, so B lives in this lovely little sheet of paper over here. That's B. B lives in this span when, uh, what was our condition? B2 minus 2B1 minus 8B3 equals zero. Uh, which 
Some of you might recognize equations like this. You probably recognize them better if they had X's in them. But what is that thing? What is that? Form a plane through the origin. So it's a subspace. Michael, HD for you, my friend. Hashtag plane. Yes, this is Cartesian. Cartesian. form of the plane as Cartesian form. Ah, dude. So the poll is blocking working for YouTube. Thank you. I can, I can kill the poll. Sorry, everybody kill poll now. There we go. Um, so that's actually Cartesian form of the plane. So actually we worked out, uh, we worked out, yeah, some a, a different kind of perspective on this thing. Nor the span, the span. You can think of the span as being naturally in um, in uh, po uh, parametric vector form, as being zero plus lambda one, one two zero plus lambda two, three minus two minus one. But we just converted from that into Cartesian form. For you uh, R3 supremacists out there, yes, you could have computed the cross product and yes, you could have found the normal that way and thereby converted from Cartesian uh, parametric vector form into point normal form, but you won't always be in R3. So this is a more general method. <sighs> okay. Let's, uh, let's do this one. A question about polynomials. How interesting. Uh, it's not immediately clear that this is a question about you. You're st I'm still confused how that's infinite, how that's infinitely. Uh, Eric, I'm not sure what you're asking me there. How there's, there's not infinitely many solutions. It's, it's not, it's not infinite. It's, it's a, this is an exactly one solution scenario. Okay. Let's do this one. Is the polynomial in the span of those set of vectors? So P p of x in the span, uh, let's call this thing s, yeah, it is called s, s when it That is to say, uh, if I, E, when lambda one X squared minus two X plus three plus lambda two, two X squared plus two X plus lambda three X minus four can be made to be equal to P of X, which is three X squared 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 plus four X plus one. Okay. So this doesn't look like a system of linear equations. What are we going to do about this? What is this doing in my notes? Um, it's minus one. Uh, thank you. That's a minus one. Um, thank you for saving me now before we got to, we got too far ahead, but I can compare. Remember this, this, this stuff is supposed to be equal. These things are supposed to be equal, which tells me a few things I can compare. Of X squared x1 and x to the zero. And that's going to give me three equations. The equ equations for a coefficient of x squared is lambda one uh, plus two lambda two uh, plus zero lambda three. I might even write that as one lambda one. And that's supposed to be equal to three. The coefficients of x to the one are minus two lambda one plus two lambda two plus lambda th plus one lambda three is equal to four. And the coefficients of uh, X to the zero, that is the constant coefficients. That's three lambda one plus zero lambda two 
plus my, oh, minus four is supposed to be equal to minus one. And I can solve this stuff with a matrix. Daniel uses compare, it's super effective. <laughs> oh dear. Okay, um, so I take all that my, my polynomial, this polynomial expression, and uh, I discover it's actually just three linear equations and I can throw that into the matrix one, two, zero, bar three, minus two, two, one, bar four, and three, zero, minus four, bar minus one. And I've got some row reduction to do, row threes. That's gonna leave me with zero, minus six, minus four, and that's minus one, minus nine is minus 10. And I might sneak in a row two is row two plus two row one. It's going to give me zero, six, uh, one, and four plus six is also 10. Uh, I can do row three is row three. In fact, I might mention that what I'm doing down here just to save space. Row three is row three plus row two, which is going to give me one, two, zero, bar three, zero, six, one, ten, zero, zero, minus three, zero, like so, like so. Um, how many solutions, how many solutions? Zero. Zero solutions infinite one. Allow me to illuminate for you the leading terms. There's a lot of ones. I'm seeing a lot of ones. Obviously, one infinity. There's a few infinities and zeros in there, but yes, it's definitely a consensus here that this has one solution to it. 15 <laughs> solutions. Ah, <laughs> oh, dear. Um, yes, one solution. Hence, do I, do I care what the values of lambda are? Do I care? No, no, I don't care. You want to show me your values of lambda? I'm like, uh, 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 uh. I don't want to so put it away. I don't want to see your lambdas. I just want to know if you've got them or not. Um, so you don't actually need to extract anything here. Hence, uh, lambda one, lam lambda two, lambda three do exist. Uh, how many, how, Richard, you determine how many solutions there are based on the taxonomy at the start of this lecture. So if you go back a few pages um, to the start of this section, there's a whole taxonomy on how you take your row echelon form and you, you take row echelon form and you just look at it and you know the answers. Um, I want you to be powerful like that. I want you to be powerful like that because it helps you answer these questions. And also when you go to a party and there's a matrix in front of you and just uh, you just impress your friends by saying, ha ha, see, see this matrix? no solutions to that system of linear equations. And everyone's like, whoa, he didn't do anything, but you just knew, you knew from the taxonomy of row echelon form matrices um, that, uh, that uh, how many solutions there exist. Okay, if we become powerful, do we become invisible? And then I throw a subspace at you. <laughs> ah, dear. Um, all right, hence those things do, do exist, do exist. And P is therefore in the span of S. You can, you can write it in this way. Yay, this expression is possible. Lots of ticks, happy times. Um, they, the lambdas do exist. You could actually find the lambdas if you really, 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 truly wanted to, uh, but 
no, I don't care. I don't care what they are. Um, I, maybe as an aside, I mentioned I might mention. Uh, still confused about the last row with the three and the zero. This tell this uh, this tells you that lambda three is equal to zero. Yes, that's exactly that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I I guess the, the the confusion might be if that was a zero, if this one was a zero and this one was a minus three, then there would be no solutions. But uh, yes, three. Yep, yeah, that, that does have a solution, and in fact, it's b lambda three is just zero. Um, so there you go. Uh, but lambda lambda one and lambda two will be different values. I have to ask, what kind of parties did you go to when you were young? I have always wondered. <laughs> I've always wondered. Um, my party, my parties would involve my my favorite kind of parties involved math. Uh, yeah. Uh, what kind of parties did I actually go to? I don't know. My life's a bit of a blur before I had children. Um, M A T H. <laughs> okay, I would I would have hoped that's clear. Um, okay, so these examples show questions about spans reduced to questions about solutions of linear ex systems of linear equations. Even when that the question about spans is about polynomials, you just convert that into questions about spans as uh, system, systems of linear equations. So sometimes you might need to work a little bit like we did with the polynomials to take this expression into uh, matrix form, but eventually questions about spans always end up being uh, more or less about this systems of linear equations. Um, do I want to do that one? Oh, you know what? I think that's probably a good place to leave it rather than try and uh, cram in spanning sets. Daniel, is there any way for you to bring the cursor pen so we can? Oh, uh, so so I might just have to underline things when you see it. Yeah, so I think I'll just have to remember to do that. Um, alrighty, so let's leave it at that for today. Um, there's still time for the challenge. If you want to get and if you want to submit an entry for the challenge, it is to prove anything using just a picture. Send it to me by. Uh, tomorrow night, the end of tomorrow night. No trouble, everybody. Uh, are you going to tell us about the infinitely many solutions? That's it's not coming this lecture. You're going to have to wait longer for it. Um, it's coming. It's coming. Uh, no problem, everybody. There'll be a new challenge on Friday, um, and I will see you all then. <laughs>